Others have been beautiful and soon forgotten. But Marilyn was a lady in distress. Perhaps she moved us because we, her would-be rescuers, wished to warn her of what she already knew, that in dreams we still are vulnerable. And even dolls can die. Desire to make you my own. I want to be loved by you, just you, nobody else but you. I want to be loved by you, the diddly 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 dum, boop boop doop. Mal Monroe was a very delicate individual. She was dependent on people all her life. She was dependent on all these forced parents. We started pretty much in Marilyn's early life and we found uh, the, the Bolanders who were her uh, foster parents for I think six years. They'd been interviewed before but no one had ever bothered to ask them, hey do you have any photographs of Marilyn? And uh, I always asked that and so I asked, hey do you have any photographs? And they had a shoebox full of photographs down in a little cupboard in the dining room. They took it out, and it was filled with photographs of Marilyn, her mother, Gladys Baker, Fran's early life, other children that she'd uh, grown up with there. We got all the still pictures from all the different people in her life at that time. They were all around. And we used all the stills. We used them in the movie. When it came time to return them, they were gone, totally lost. We couldn't find them. And the insurance company had to pay all these people for the loss of the still. Therefore, nobody else had them in their film. They were lost. Twenty years later, I'm looking in my warehouse, and I see a box that says pictures. I say, I wonder what pictures these are. I got them, I, I opened the page, and would you believe it? There's the lost stills. Nobody had seen them for 20 years. They were in the film, and they're in the box. The originals, gone for 20-something years, it just appears now. So all those years, nobody had the use of that material. What really struck me was how the whole world, you know, how, what a hold she had on so many other people. And I think that's what fascinated me and why I did the film, really, is to find out what the quality was that she had, the vulnerability, the honesty, whatever it was, that affected so many people. And... Um, touched so many people. In those days, too, I mean, I found other things that, like, sexual information things, you know. And don't forget, this was 1963, I'm making this film, and you couldn't do in 1963 what you can do in uh, 2002. And so I, I discovered some interesting, you know, gossipy type stuff, which uh, did not get into the film. And, uh, but as far as uh, her death, the conspiracy theories at that time were not really developed, you know, about uh, whether it was the Mafia or whether it was the Kennedys or whoever it was, you know. I think that there's a lot of confusion of, you know, how did she die and there was, of course, an inquest that decided it was a um, probable suicide. And I think it, uh, that's probably the best explanation. My film does not refute that she had made a, 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 had a love affair with Kennedy. My film refutes that Kennedy Bobby Kennedy came down from San Francisco, broke into the house and killed her. Whether she had an affair with Kennedy or didn't, I don't know. I used to eat at the Villa Capri restaurant in Hollywood where a lot of the stars ate. I ate it was a bachelor, I ate there every night. That was my dining room. And one night, Frank Sinatra, Joe DiMaggio, Billy Karen, who was the maitre d' of the restaurant, Barney Rudisky, who was a, a, a ex-police private detective, were there and plotting something. I found out later what the plot was. They had heard that Marilyn Monroe was sleeping with her first song, uh, personal health with her voice, her voice instructor, and, and possibly another woman. And so they decided they knew exactly what, where she was. They were going to go in and break in on her and take a picture of it. So the four of them with a the cameraman go to this house, go to this apartment, up to the room, break down the door, rush into the bedroom, and there's a woman sitting in a bed, it's not Marilyn Monroe, they broke into the wrong apartment. This woman was a 37-year-old woman. She looked this, I, I always laugh, at, how do you like to wake up in the middle of the night and see Frank Sinatra and Joe DiMaggio in your bedroom with a cameraman? 
Anyway, it was the wrong door breaking, a famous story. They left, went back to the Villa Capri. This woman sued them for $200,000, and she finally, of course, it was Joe DiMaggio. She was some kind of a baseball fan. She settled for $7,500. But that's the famous Marilyn Monroe break-in. I think that the one thing that uh, I would have put in the film today, but couldn't have then, was um, her relationship with women. And I think that there were some relationships with women that were pretty interesting. I think she was preyed upon and, and just used by men. So she probably, part of her hated men, you know? She was uh, from uh, her earliest years. Going to a woman, you know, for um, solace and comfort and companionship and so forth, um, is something that still people aren't that interested in. You know, they, they, they wanted to be just this, the sex symbol for men, you know, and I think that uh, that there was an element of, uh, I won't say lesbianism, but of, uh, you know, liking women and trusting them, probably trusting women. Marilyn Monroe went down to Korea to entertain the troops and she sang and was, she was a, a tremendous smash. I mean, Marilyn Monroe and the troops and she was just terrific. So she comes back to Tokyo to Joe DiMaggio, who's waiting in Tokyo for her. And she's talking to him, and I said, Joe, you cannot imagine what it is to have 100,000 men screaming and yelling your name. And he looks at her and says, yes, I know, Marilyn. Yes, I can imagine. One of the people we interviewed was Tom Kelly, the famous, who took the famous nude photograph of Marilyn Monroe for the calendar. And I said to Terry, I said, we can't put that nude picture on network television. They won't allow it. So he came up with the great idea of doing the negative of the Marilyn Monroe nude. So you, you could just see the outline. You knew it was a nude picture, but it just passed the network censor. But in our show, we also have something else. There was another nude of Marilyn Monroe nobody ever knew about. We had the first nude of Marilyn Monroe, even before Mr. Kelly. And I'd like to show you the first nude picture exclusively in our film of Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn was sort of guileless. I mean, she was not a schemer. She was uh, a very honest, straight uh, person who uh, I think people responded and they did two things. They took advantage of her, but they also wanted to help her. And uh, audiences uh, just gravitated to that. When physical beauty, although that was there, but the, the childlike beauty of her soul, which really also came through. Her first hair was dark, well, she had darker hair, and they, they bleached it blonde. And uh, she had the hair was very low on her face. And, it, and it's, some people at Columbia, when she did her first picture at Columbia, felt it would be better if her hairline was high. So they did electrolysis and, and raised her hairline. That was the first piece of surgery change to her face. When she met Johnny Hyde, he felt her nose was not exactly right. And so he had her nose made a little small, a little wide. And it made it, And the third thing he did is have her chin was very thin. He had her chin wide. So in your film, when you see Marilyn Monroe before she meets Johnny Hyde, you'll see, notice the nose and the chin will be slightly different from one part of her life to another. In spite of all the stuff, she never had breast surgery. That, that was, those were real. And they, we're pretty good to the end of it. You know, I think that what I was looking for was the uh, humanity, not the news, because uh, I think that uh, what gave me a jolt were things like when uh, her first husband, Jim Doherty, said, he says, uh, you know, I never knew Marilyn Monroe. I knew Norma Jean Baker. A showman's gimmick had turned a sidewalk into a pantheon of Hollywood's gods. Now, the Jane Russell, Norma Jean came back to Grauman's. Like the heroine of her own girlhood fantasy, Marilyn was accorded the immortality of wet cement.